This park story goes way back to 1865, the same year the Civil War ended. When John Librand opened a public bathhouse in the soon-to-be community of Santa Cruz, California, the bathhouse was an instant success with locals. So other people began ripping off Mr. Librand's idea, and multiple bathhouses began sprouting up all along the coast. Now, with more bathhouses came more tourists, and more tourists came more businesses, and Santa Cruz quickly became a hotspot for summer vacationers. Then one day toward the end of the century, a flamboyant entrepreneur by the name of Fred W. Swanton stumbled upon this booming community, and he quickly envisioned it as the, quote, Coney Island of the West. So being a driven fellow, Mr. Swanton acted immediately and bought up as many of the bathhouses as he could and put his plans in motion to construct a boardwalk and a casino. And in 1907, the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk officially opened to the general public. The following year, in 1908, the park's first thrill ride opened, the L.A. Thompson Scenic Railway. And three years after that, the park opened its now legendary Luff Carousel, with the main feature of this ride being to grab one of the brass rings and then throw it into the clown's mouth on your way around. By 1914, Mr. Swanton had started a company with a bunch of local investors called the Santa Cruz Seaside Company. And after seven years of operating the park, Mr. Swanton decided to sell all his shares in the park, and he bowed out of the theme park game. But hey, pretty cool though, he went on to become mayor of Santa Cruz from 1927 to 1933. And you know, he's the one that started it all. Respect. By 1921, the automobile, which was kind of a novelty when the park very first opened, was quickly becoming common amongst Americans to own. And thus, new roads were popping up all over the place. And California State Highway 17 really began to take shape, which brought in way more people. In 1923, we saw the removal of the L.A. Thompson Scenic Railway, but that was to make way the following year for a little piece of legendary. The Giant Dipper opened the following year, standing 70 feet tall, racing guests at 55 miles per hour, and manufactured by D.H. Morgan Manufacturer. The ride is still in operation today and is absolutely iconic. That's an understatement. The following year saw the addition of a fun house. And then shortly after that, the Great Depression hit, sweeping all across America, messing everything all the f up. So nothing really happened for almost a 30 year span, with the exception of 1934 when the casino was repackaged as Coconut Grove and primarily became a concert venue. Now fast forward 18 years, it's 1952, World War II has ended, and the 50s are a banging time in the country's history. Now Lawrence Canfield, who was a member of the Santa Cruz Seaside Company, decided now was the time to make his move. He bought out his partners and took over the controlling interest in the company. And the Canfield family still owns and operates the park to this day. In 1954, the park added Rocco Plane, a very unique flat ride. It's kind of a hybrid of a Ferris wheel and a salt and pepper shaker. Very unique, still in operation to this day. Four years after that, in 1958, the park built an in-house roller coaster, a wooden wild mouse coaster, appropriately named Wild Mouse. And to close out the 1950s, the following year, the park added its iconic Ferris wheel. 1961, the park added a dark ride called the Cave Train, where guests time travel back to a prehistoric city that resides in a cave. 1962, the park added Flying Cages, a interesting looking flat ride. I'm not really sure what the f is going on here. I th I think Knobles had one of these also. 1967, the park added Sky Glider, a chairlift which transported guests from one end of the boardwalk to the other. And with the ocean right there, it might be the best of its kind in the world. We kicked off the 1970s with the removal of the Fun House. But 1972, we got two new rides. We got a Roundup called Super Roundup and a Schwarzkopf Jetstar model called Jetstar. And also that year, we had the removal of that what the thing called flying cages. The following year, the park added the Haunted Castle, an indoor dark ride haunted house. Fast forward three years, and we saw the removal of the Wild Mouse. But that cleared up space for an iconic ride the following year, the park's infamous log flume, Logger's Revenge. Now that closed out the pretty quiet decade known as the 70s. Now we're going to jump ahead to the following decade, the 1980s which surprisingly was even more quiet than the previous decade. Of course, I mean in terms of the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk, because the 80s were f***ing wild. The first major thing that happened in the 80s was 1984 with the addition of Pirate Ship. In 1987, the park received some national attention, which it rightfully deserved, as the Luff Carousel and the Giant Dipper were both designated as National Historic Landmarks. 
And to close out the 80s in 1988, the Santa Cruz Seaside Company purchased two nearby hotels, the Sea and Sand Inn and the Carousel Beach Inn, becoming official hotels of the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk. In 1991, the park added Typhoon, a Fabry Ranger model. And we also saw the removal of the Super Roundup and Jetstar. Now, Jetstar was sold to Thrillville, USA out of Turner, Oregon, where it operated for 14 years as Ripper. And after that, it was sold to Sochi Park in Russia, where it operates still today as a roller coaster. In 1992, the park received Hurricane, an SDC Hurricane model. Now, I never had a chance to ride one of these, but they look pretty fun. It looks kind of like a more intense Zyklon. In the middle of the decade, 1995, the park received its very first motion simulator called Venture Simulator. 1997, the park received a Chance Chaos model called Chaos. Those rides were a ton of fun. In 1998, the park received three new rides. A Sartori Miami called Crazy Surf and a Huss Breakdance called Wipeout. A family roller coaster called the Orient Express. 1999 saw a Super Bob added to the park in Tsunami. Also, we saw the abrupt closure of Orient Express, and it was sold to Palace Playland in Old Orchard Beach, Maine, where it operates still today, under the same name. But the park received a new family coaster the following year, and the addition of Sea Serpent, an Ian e F. Miller Industries family roller coaster custom built. 2001, the park added a Sally Corp Dark Ride Dark Shooter in Ghost Blasters. Love those rides. 2002 saw the removal of Chaos, but the following year, we got something pretty cool in Cliffhanger. Manufactured by Dartron, it's kind of like if you took a paratrooper and made it simulate hang gliding. That's what it is. 2004, we had another ride from Dartron in Cyclone, one of their roundups. Also that year, we saw the removal of the Venture Simulator. 2005, so the park had a 125 foot tall shot tower from SNS called Double Shot. 2007 was the first time the park won the Golden Ticket Award for Best Seaside Amusement Park, an award it went on to win a numerous amount of times after. Also that year we got the addition of Fireball, a frisbee attraction manufactured by KMG. And finally in 2007 we get the removal of Typhoon. 2009 saw the closure of the Haunted Castle to some chagrin, but the following year we got a new updated version under the same name. 2011 saw the closure of Crazy Surf Volume 1. In 2012, we got Crazy Surf Volume 2. We also had the removal of Hurricane that year, where it went to Western Playland in Sunland Park, New Mexico, where it still operates today, under the same name. 2013, the park added Undertow, a bat spinning coaster from Mauer Ride, standing 50 feet tall and spinning guests at 40 miles per hour. Small footprint, but a solid ride. 2017, we got two new flat rides, a Zamperla Disco known as Shockwave, and an updated version of Typhoon, this one manufactured by ARM. Now the heartbreak and shocker of this year was easily the removal of the Ferris wheel. It was iconic, part of the Santa Cruz skyline, but time to go. In the following year in 2018, we had the removal of Crazy Surf Volume 2, just to get Crazy Surf Volume 3 the following year. 2020, the park was closed pretty much the whole time because of that infamous thing we all had to endure. Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk is a California staple, and I think the Golden Ticket Awards got it right. It is the best seaside amusement park, and it was almost my home park. I have a special place in my heart for the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk, and it's definitely a place you all need to get to at least once.